yeah, so anyways, dude, I was just wanted to catch up with you, see how you're feeling after NSC trials. I know you didn't technically have to qualify, but uh, the way that we did it this year is I really just wanted to treat it more like a pro event because in previous years when we did NSC tryouts, all of the politics and stuff started coming into play. You'd get someone to win a race, they'd quit. And so this year we said, well, we're still gonna do a tryouts, but we're gonna make it just a standard pro event. We're gonna give prize money so no one tries to help anybody. And so just wanted to catch up with you. We're about mid season and, and kind of see, you know, how things are going. Yeah, the event was great. You know, those that rule that you guys had for uh, changing it up a little bit so there wasn't the politics and the team skating and all that. Uh, you know, I had people coming up to me at the meet and they were like, Gabe, why are you even skating this? Yeah. You don't need to. I'm like, well, there's money. Yeah. I'm getting that money. <laughs> yeah, but the money part's always cool, right? Exactly. Yeah, and, and I, I figured that would help quite a bit. And um, uh, the other part that I, I thought was pretty awesome was when we got to those flying hundreds, I couldn't believe how many people went under uh, eight five. God, I like, know. That was insane. Dude, had me stressing. I'm like, shit, yeah. am I going to be able to do this? Yeah, yeah. Well, we've been running that race since 2009. And uh, when we first started doing the race, it's not really fair to compare times because the reality is uh, at that point we were using non-banded wheels. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously banded wheel technology has come a long way. Uh, but the reality is the times uh, for that flying hundred have held for so damn long. Um, I want to say that the original record was done on season three of the NSC, which is like, what is that, 2011? And then uh, Jonathan Blair came in behind that, and I think that was 2018. I think it was... Yeah, 18 yeah. and 19, because I was there. I actually got third in that time trial, and I was like a sophomore. Yeah, yeah. and and then now uh, your time, and, and I'm not sure, you know, it, it, you see that, and you see the, the fastest time, but then it's kind of hard to put that in, in context, because unless you know the people that have come before you, you don't really understand the magnitude of that, right? And I was thinking yeah. about that on my drive today, because I knew we were going to talk, and I was like, damn, in that 100 meter, you had Michael Cheeks, who's ran that race since 2010, right? Because we've been yeah. doing NSC for a long time. Uh, you have Joey Mantia, you have Chad Horn, you have Jeremy Anderson, you have Jarrett Paul, um, you have Justin Stelly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you name Brandon Hall, Adrian Workman. I mean, you name it. You have, it's, it's insane to me because it's literally the fastest time anyone's ever ran for that race. And, um, you know, you can say it's technology, but at the end of the day, you need two things to happen for that to, to work out. You need an incredible athlete and you need, you need a uh, product that works and, and it seemed to line up for mm -hmm. you. So, yeah, I mean, like with the, with the build up to that event, I was stressed and I was just, you know, there's so much going on. Everybody's running fast times. And then Roman went out there and ran that 8-3-1. I'm like, how am I supposed to beat that? There's no way I'm beating it unless I possibly break into the twos. Yeah. So I'm like, shit, okay, I'll just get my build up. I'll try and just make a smooth lap out of it. I go and run the time and I couldn't believe it. Did it feel that fast? I honestly didn't think so. It, yeah. I didn't feel like it was as fast as I could have gone because I had a bark in my first actual corner. Yeah. So my, my buildup was good, but my first corner wasn't the best. But I, I definitely didn't think I was going that fast. Yeah, yeah. We, I, after I saw Roman's time, I mean, after, reality is after I saw Miles' time and uh, I think Jacob ran a fast time too, didn't Dude, he? Dude, Axel ran an Oh, and Axel ran, yeah, it was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And I always try to do the order in what I think is the highest likeliness that the time keeps breaking. Right. Mm -hmm. So like in, in the women's event, I had a feeling Tori was going to run the fastest time and she ran a stupid fast time too. Um, and then in your guys' event, I was like, ah, I think Gabe can go <laughs> eight two. So I, you know, I put you last and, and then, uh, uh, that place was loud when it happened. I, I don't think I've ever heard that many people freak out yeah for at least for me yeah god you forget uh how exciting that race is until you 
pack a bunch of speed skaters in a building that are really into it yep. and, and you just have time breaking after time breaking and then to have the last person just go and smash it is insane. It, it was nuts. Even just watching it, like while I, I still have to race it and just watching it, the, the excitement was everywhere. Yeah. It was nuts. I've, um, I've noticed that as the uh, more experienced skaters get more reps at that race, uh, they tend to, to do a better job of just running that. Is there a particular strategy when you're running that race? Like, what, what are you doing when you go out there? Is it as simple as, I'm just going to slap hands real quick and sprint? Or, like, what, walk us through, like, how you run that race. So how I run 100, and I've practiced my 100 plenty of times because, you know, I, I try to be the best at it. So I go out there, and I'll build my first lap as hard as I can. So it is as fast as I can go for that first lap on that build. And when I cross that line, I have to be at 100% full sprint and you just maintain for that last one. Because you're, you're realistically not going to build off of your like, actual 100 meter and get a fast time. And a lot of people don't get that. Yeah. And I, I, I really do hate to say it, but a lot of people, they'll go out there, they'll just sprint and they'll, they'll get a fast time, but they're way better than that. Yeah. I've noticed that too where... I don't remember who I was explaining this to before. It was someone who hasn't really ran the race before is that if you cross the line and you're not at a hundred percent speed, that means that you lost all of the time as you're accelerating to a hundred percent speed. And I think that people have an insecurity that if they sprint too early, that they're going to bark out in the corner. But like you're saying, all of the times that I see that tend to be the winning times, when they crossed the line, they were at maximum speed. And then it's, can you maintain for the entire lap without, you know, having a big slip? And, mm. and those people tend to run pretty fast times with it. Yeah, that so, seems to be the case. Yeah. Um, so switching kind of topics here, I kind of wanted to just touch on everything. and I don't want to take too much of your time today. But um, as we're getting kind of halfway into the season, you know, in Washington, we don't get the, the best weather. We're just starting to kind of, you know, touch outdoor a little bit, right? I think what would have we had one or two skates, not, not a ton. I mean, I mean I've gone you, out. You've yeah. snuck out a few times. I haven't, admittedly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not going to skate when it's cold, so I need good weather. But, uh, you know, how do you supplement in your training uh, for outdoors when you don't have access to it the full year like other places in the country? Like, what are you doing to, to, to deal with that? To be honest, all you can really do is skate indoor and then cross train with like weights and cycling. That's the best you can do. I mean, a lot of people like dry land. I've done it and I, I tried to do it for months and I didn't really feel like I got much out of it. But a lot of people feel like their technique gets better when they do it. Mm -hmm. But going out there and skating real outdoor is the only thing I can say that helps. Yeah. I'd be curious now that we're getting to a place where people in our country are starting to think about specialization a little bit more. You know, when, when uh, I was younger, there was this idea that you were going to try to race the shortest race and the longest race at Worlds if you were the, the best guy. And, and there have been some amazing people that have done that. Um, but I, I don't think that that's very realistic anymore, especially as other countries are, are have, especially like a country like Colombia that's so dominant and they're doing specialization. What's your mindset as you're, you know, training towards an outdoor nationals or a world? Are you trying to specialize in something and what your training regiment look like uh, in that? So when I, when I went to worlds for, uh, what was it in 2022 or 21, whenever I won my medal, I was training specifically sprints and mm -hmm. very explosive activities, and that's what I ended up getting my medal in was one of the sprints, the one lap. But I believe that at this point in the game, like as our sport as a whole has gone to specialization, it, it's not something you can well round. You can't be a Swiss Army knife in the sport anymore. It yeah. just doesn't work. Yeah, it's very difficult. Now, what do you think your your best distances are? Like, do you think you're more of a sprinter, a middle distance? I mean, I, I've seen you win distance races too. It's not like that's not in your, you know. Yeah, I, I believe that, I mean, I'm, I'm well-rounded, I believe, but I, I think I'm more of a sprinter. I can do those distance races, but I'm more explosive than I can skate longer. I just, yeah, I'm better at that. Yeah, when I, you know, this is, this is my own, personal view when I watch you is I think that 
you're a very good sprinter. I think you're a world-class middle distance athlete. Like if I had to pick your race, I'd say I would bet on a thousand meters because you get some guys that are just like absolute specialists in sprinting, meaning that, you know, after 300 meters, you see their legs go. That doesn't tend to be you. You seem like you can get a little bit deeper into, um, you know, in, in, into that uh, distance. So, so kind of getting into the weeds of, of the, the training, like, you know, I would love for, for someone younger out there to get some guidance that's like, you know, right at that level of, of you know, trying to go for junior worlds. Like, what, give us kind of actual details of what, like, what like a typical training regiment does. So like when you're, when you're, you know, let's call it training camp, like, right, like a boxer's training yeah. camp, Gabe's in that three month window of when it's really time to get prepared. What does that look like training wise? When I uh, was training for my medal, I had to, I would wake up in the morning, I'd make my breakfast, I'd go out and I'd jog for about two miles, I'd come back in, I'd take about, you know, a few hour rest, I'd get a snack, I'd go downstairs, I'd lift probably, I'd go and do squats, pretty heavy, then again I'd rest, and then I would bike, and then I'd sleep and repeat, Yeah. and it was just day in, day and out. And I'm assuming obviously mixing skating oh, in yeah. there now. How much skating are we doing in comparison to the off skate activities? So if you're like, is it 60% skate, 40% off, or what, what is that like? What does that look like? So it was typically more off skate, more just cross training than actually skating itself. I only got to skate maybe like three, four times a week mm -hmm. compared to where I was training every day of the week. Yeah. And it was intense. So now was that preference or lack of ability to access skating because of rain or whatever reasons was, like is that is that the ideal for you i mean it was probably a mixture of both if if i could choose i would skate all the time i would skate every single day if the weather was great here yeah. shit, i'd be outside every day yeah, I, yeah. the last three days i was even thinking about going and skating today the last three days i just skated outdoor one one two three in a row yeah and i've been having so much fun i went out and i skated uh the red lot and then i went to enum and i did two 15 k's yeah and i just I just enjoy being out in the sun, but yeah. now it's all gone. So yeah, now it's gone. It'll come back. But yeah, <laughs> I know. We had everyone come up for the the meet. It's like it's like it's almost like a little dagger. They go, oh, Seattle. It always rains, and we're like, you gotta see our summertime, yeah, dude. It's it was like best. nice the week before yeah. too, and the the second everybody's here, it's like oh, yeah. raining again. And they're just like, is it like this all the time? We're like, no, it's not like this all the time. <laughs> dude, the summers here are so pretty. It's the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So. Um, you know, we, we don't have a lot of season, uh, left. We're starting to get into some of the more serious races. We, you know, uh, we had, uh, Dave Weber's meet, which is, I, I would call that, you know, probably winter nationals at this point. It's such a big, uh, competition. We have NSC trials and other, uh, big events and Roanoke just happened. And so we're, we're kind of getting towards like the final events of the year with, um, indoor nationals, outdoor nationals and worlds. Um, and, uh, even, uh, um, uh, the other national championships. I'm, why am I drawing? Oh, blank? the uh, USSRS. Uh, yes, the US. Well, how, what is there? Oh, it's called the American Championship. Yeah, I don't know why. I was I've been there that. so many times. I should know. Yeah, this. you should know. We, yeah, you go every single year. The American Championships mm -hmm. as, as well. Um, what events are you looking forward to for the remainder of the season? Um, I'm gonna have to say our event. Yeah, for one. NSC 36. Yep. Shout out. <laughs> yeah. And then good. second, probably indoor nationals, but uh, outdoor nationals as well, and hopefully after outdoor nationals, worlds. Yeah. So. Yeah. It. Um. I was. You know, this is me just uh, being very wishful thinking. Um. But I was uh, talking to some of the the board members uh, for USA Roller Sports, and I was telling them that. I think things would change dramatically if they figured out a way to uh, pay a handful of the athletes way, right? Like I know that there's no way in today's numbers that they could pay for an entire senior and junior team, but even if they could just backtrack some of the math and go, what would this look like if you paid for four athletes or six athletes? Because I think that the issue that we have is that you have top tier athletes that would go, even if I made it financially, it's very difficult to justify indoor nationals, outdoor nationals, and worlds all within a very small time frame. Yeah. But 
if, you're, if you had a shot at Worlds being paid for, you would go and take the risk to go to outdoor nationals. And then if you made team and maybe you didn't rank high enough on, on the team, well then at least you could go, well, I can't go. But you wouldn't have certain people just flat out not even going to outdoor nationals because they know that they can't afford Worlds. And to me, yeah. that's a big problem. Yeah, it is. Because I mean, I had to decline my spot, a, I think it was a year or two ago, because we couldn't afford it. It was just too much money. Um, and you know, it would have been really nice to go. It was in Argentina and yeah. you know. And you were I, fast. I, I was, I, I won almost every single race I skated at that nationals too. It's crazy. Cause I, th I think that, I think our country is still capable of getting a lot of medals. I've actually been really excited recently with the younger crop of athletes when you're, when you're looking at the kids that are coming up because there was a time period where there was a little bit of gap and people weren't taking it as serious. But when you look at the group that there is today, like there's some incredible athletes in the U.S. and they're already at a significant disadvantage. That's one thing I get a little frustrated about when I read things online and people are comparing them to essentially professional athletes. Mm -hmm. And the, the big difference of it is like, like you go to work every day. I don't know if people realize that, but like you're going to work every single day and then you're building your training around your job. But a lot of the people you compete against, it is their job to skate. And yeah. it's a big disadvantage. And so if there was more funding that happened in the United States and, you know, obviously you wouldn't be able to quit your job, but if you could do it part time or something like that, yeah. it's way different, you mm -hmm. know? So, I mean, I, looking back at it now, when I was just a student athlete, I took that for granted, yeah. it, you know? Once you, I started working, it started to get harder to train. But I, I think it's motivated me more to train, but not everybody's going to be like that. And yeah. That's just, it, it's how life is. Yeah. You know? Now there's, there's rumors, um, and, and this rumor's been out there for a while, and, and uh, I guess I wouldn't even call it a rumor. At some point, there's supposed to be indoor world championships. I guess the rumor always aspect of that is always like, when is it gonna happen? Yeah. And it, it's gotten pushed out a few times. Um, I've talked to Joe Hanna. He's told me it's looking very realistic uh, for, you know, I, I believe he said 2026. If, if uh, Joe don't kill me if I, <laughs> if I said, I think he said 2026. Um, out of curiosity, like, what would mean more to you an indoor world championship medal or an outdoor world championship medal? And Definitely indoor. Yeah? yeah. Is, that, is that what your preference? I mean, I, I love indoor. I, I grew up skating indoor. I used to go to the rink when I was younger. It's just something I've enjoyed my whole life. And being able to do it at a world level and say, I am the best yeah. at this would be amazing. I feel like in the United States for the majority of time that indoors existed, winning indoor nationals or winning the NSC did put you at a level of saying that you were probably the best in the world, but it's different when you officially have a world championships, right? Like in the NSC, we've had several world champions skate in the uh, NSC. Uh, no one internationally has ever won. We've had some incredible skaters. No one's ever won. Um, I'd love to see uh, Ducio and you go at it this year because I feel like that would be pretty definitive if, if you get a guy like him that can skate indoors and uh, to put that stamp on it. But, you know, the, the one part that I find interesting is that if there's always an assumption that if a skater is good at one, that they're good at something else, right? Mm -hmm. And what I found uh, interesting is when we went to Columbia, there were kids that were better at indoors that weren't on the world team than the world team members that were really good at outdoors. And I was like, you know what? That's exactly how it is in the United States too. Like Washington's always been known for uh, indoor speed skating. You know, shout out to, to Jeremy Anderson because he's a guy who never really had much interest in outdoor. I don't think, no, Jeremy's never made a world team, but he's, in my opinion, at least top five best indoor skaters ever uh, skated. And so I think that when we get to the point of an indoor world championship, what will be interesting is I think you'll actually see world teams with several members who are not on the outdoor team and not on the, in you get what I'm saying? Like no, yeah, I get across, that. So. Yeah, I mean, if you train for something your whole life, like I have for indoor, and 
you get really good at it. You build an amazing technique. I mean, I was taught by Jeremy. Yep. I, that's, that's all I know is his technique drills. Yeah. And I go and skate outdoor, and it's so unfamiliar to me compared <laughs> to indoor. Yeah. I just wish that I could prove what I'm good at to the world and not try and go and do something that I'm not good at, I, I guess. I feel like the equivalent is like, hey, I know you've skated short track your entire life and you don't have access to an oval and every once in a while, we're just gonna throw you on the oval and then we gotta pretend like you're not as good as you really are because you've never skated on the oval and then the whole country's mad at you because you're not as good on a 400 meter track as you are on a, you yeah, know. Yeah, that makes like, perfect sense. You know, and, I, and, and uh, I would, I bet you if you took long track skaters and you're just like, all right, time to pivot on a short track, they'd be like, this is really unfamiliar and it would work the exact uh, same way. But for whatever reason in our sport and specifically in America, there's this idea that you just are going to be super good at indoors and you're like, all right, go on a bank track. Now, I do think, I do see things changing because if we have access to the facilities and the tracks, things change really quickly for us. Um, Tori Weber, uh, you know, she gets to have a bank track in her backyard, and I'm so insanely jealous. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> of this, I bet you you're going to start seeing a lot of Florida skaters go to the next level simply from access to a bank track and having a large group of skaters that are good there. So think about it like this: if you skate by yourself all the time, right? and you go and try and get in a race, you're probably not gonna do that well, Yeah. okay? You take people that skate just road outdoor and you put them on a track, it's almost the exact same way, Yeah. okay? You have no idea how you're supposed to skate on a track, your pattern's gonna be different than everybody else, if it's a parabolic, God help you. Where do you even pass at? Exactly. Like to be able to time that at that, so like you, you know like this, right? Like, when you get to that high of a level and you're making decisions that are fractions of a second, and if you mistime that decision, we're all on the ground, mm -hmm. that's from you know, 20 years, not even you don't have that many years, <laughs> I have 30 years, but that's from you know, a decade more of experience. Yeah. And then you're supposed to understand when you get to skate a, a track you know, two, three times a year, you're supposed to have that understanding of, of that timing. It's, it's, it takes it's, it's hard to, yeah. yeah. You, you don't get that type of experience from just skating by yourself. Yeah, so anyways, well, we just wanted to catch up and just get a feel, and it, it's nice to do this. We, uh, at some point, we got to do some more fun stuff. I think it would be cool if we, if we started doing some like uh, videos where we're critiquing technique or just even having fun reaction videos yeah. or just getting on the camera more. You know, Ron, Ron's like, hey, we haven't shot content for a while, so it's nice just to, to catch up. Yeah, the reaction video would be funny. Yeah, mm -hmm. so anyways. Thanks for chatting, dude. All right, see you. Cool.